regarding uh, President Obama's uh, statement uh, about Senator McCain and myself, I just want the President to know that I do hold him ultimately responsible for what happened in Benghazi above all others. And uh, I think him calling out myself and Senator McCain is a political diversion. He has an obligation to tell the American people what he knew, when he knew it, and what he did about it. He's yet to fulfill that obligation. Benghazi is a uh, case study in what happens when you leave from behind. I blame President Obama for allowing the place to become a death trap. I'm certain he was aware of the June attack. Uh, he had to be informed of the fact that the British had left because Benghazi was too dangerous. The Red Cross had closed their office, but yet we left our consulate open and unprotected. There's numerous calls for assistance coming from the people on the ground in Libya. They were all denied. We were trying to form a uh, new relationship, a normalized relationship with the Libyan government that didn't exist. So, Mr. President, I hold you responsible for allowing the consulate to become a death trap. I hold you responsible for not having military assets or could be uh, deployed within eight hours to help the people who were under attack on September 11th of all days. And I also hold you responsible for uh, creating a false narrative uh, about what actually happened in Benghazi. Uh, you chose Susan Rice, who knew nothing about Benghazi. The last thing in the world you should have done is sent someone out to explain Benghazi, and that person have no direct knowledge or responsibility over the event. So I think this is something that the President has to answer for. I praise President Obama uh, when, we, uh, when we got bin Laden. That was a gutsy call on the President's part. And uh, I think he has to account for Benghazi. You can't just have praise. You also have to have accountability. And my beef with the President is not personal. I'm doing what I think every United States Senator should do in a situation like this hold the executive branch responsible for what I think was a system failure. So it's not personal between me and the President. And trying to make it personal is a political diversion. I'm going to get to the bottom of this because the people uh, in this country need to know, needs to know what happened. And we cannot let it happen again. And finally, the families of the four brave Americans who were killed need to know uh, what happened. Okay. Any questions about that? When do you think he learned of the Benghazi attack? I think the process that we're uh, using to get to the truth is failing. Instead of having four different committees interview witnesses separate and apart, mm -hmm. I think we need a select committee to investigate Benghazi like they had for Iran-Contra. Uh, the Judiciary Committee should be looking at what the FBI did. Uh, the Armed Services Committee should be looking at what the military did and being unable to help people for eight hours on September the 11th. We couldn't get any military aid to these people. The CIA needs to be held accountable for, for their role in this and God knows the State Department. You know, why Hillary Clinton did not grant the request for reinforcement of the consulate, I'll never know, but if the person I hold most responsible is the President. But instead of doing four different committees, we should combine the resources of these four committees and tell the story of Benghazi from start to finish. Investigate the months before the attack. How did this place stay open when everybody else closed their consulate? Why did it stay open? Why did we deny numerous requests for additional security? Uh, why did we fail to understand what they were telling us? That Al-Qaeda was coming back in Benghazi big time and we can't defend this consulate. And after, how could the story be so off base and the story being told for two weeks after the attack be disconnected from reality. And why did the President himself for two weeks claim that the attack was a result of a video when we all know that's not true? Uh, Israel, you talked about making the trip there soon. Can I just add one thing? If we don't do a select committee, if we don't combine resources, we're going to go off in four different directions and the truth is going to fall through the cracks best thing to do is for the same group of people to hear from every witness so they can put the puzzle together. You talked about Israel. What role does the U.S. play and what's the plan? Well, the, president is, the President is right to say that Israel uh, has a right to defend herself against rocket attacks. I don't think the average American can really appreciate what the Israelis live under. What would we do if our nation was attacked with one rocket coming from a foreign country? We would go after the people <coughs> with a vengeance. The Israelis live under rocket attack daily. There have been thousands of rockets fired into Israel randomly. 
the reason they haven't hit a schoolhouse and killed a bunch of children is the Israeli defenses and sheer luck. How would you feel mm -hmm. as a parent if you had a neighboring nation firing at your children randomly? And, and, and Israel's the problem? I would like to see a two-state solution, but I stand behind Israel's right to defend herself. And these rockets that are coming into uh, Gaza are coming out of the Sudan and through Egypt. We need to let Egypt know that you have new leadership, but we're going to hold you accountable. I do believe in trying to help the Egyptian people form a new democracy, but I expect the Egyptian president and the new Egyptian government to try to bring about peace, not incite violence. I hope one of the casualties of the Israeli-Hamas conflict that you see going on your television will not be the loss of a good relationship between the United States and Egypt. And some of the things coming out of Egypt are just totally unacceptable. But my, my point, I guess, is about Benghazi. It's just not about the consulate being attacked. I think it's exhibit A of a failed foreign policy. Last week, there was a, a conflict between the Kurds and the Arabs in Iraq. There's going to be a civil war in Iraq because we left the place unsecured. We were inside the 10-yard line, and President Obama fumbled the ball by withdrawing troops. Everybody's going back to their sectarian camps. You see Egypt, instead of playing a helpful role with the Israeli-Hamas conflict, inciting violence. You had warlords in Afghanistan from the Northern Alliance threatening to rearm their people whilst Afghanistan is falling apart because people think we're leaving. The King of Jordan is under assault. The Mideast is about to blow up. Last week, the United Nations said Iran is still not complying with efforts to find out about their nuclear program. So it's just not about Benghazi. Benghazi is an example of a failed foreign policy. And if President Obama doesn't change his strategy in terms of dealing with radical Islam, there's going to be more Libyas to come. And my big concern is not just about how the consulate was so undefended, but about the thinking that led to this. If you think we can have a small footprint in times of danger, you're wrong. We need to have an aggressive presence in the Mideast to stay ahead of conflict. This idea of leading from behind makes our friends uncertain, and it emboldens our enemies, and it all came to a head in Libya, a consulate that should have been closed. Everyone else left Benghazi but us, and the president left these people in a terrible spot for months. And when that fateful day occurred, it was on 9-11 of all days, and the fact that we could not reinforce this consulate for eight hours is just totally unacceptable. What military assets were available to him <clears throat> once the attack started? I cannot believe there were not fighter aircraft available in Italy and surrounding American bases to come to the aid of the consulate. On August the 15th, a uh, cable was sent from Libya to Secretary, Secretary of State Clinton saying, there's 10 Al-Qaeda militia groups we've identified in Benghazi. Two of them have claimed credit for the attack. And uh, Ambassador Stevens said on the 15th of August, if there's a coordinated attack by Al-Qaeda, we cannot defend the consulate. So it should either have been closed or heavily reinforced. But uh, on September 11th, the day of heightened concern for American interest all over the world, name a place on the planet more exposed than Benghazi, Libya. I find it heartbreaking and impossible to believe that on September 11th we did not have a military plan to come to the assistance of those who said they were going to be attacked and in fact they were attacked so the Department of Defense needs to account for that. Were people watching in the White House Situation Room in real time? They saw There those? was real-time reports of the attack within 24 hours it was known to be a terrorist attack. The CIA station chief in Benghazi says we're under attack he named the people involved. There was a Facebook posting by one of the Al-Qaeda groups claiming credit for it. General Petraeus testified that the memo he sent up identified Al-Qaeda. This is what's so important. The fact that Susan Rice and the President himself uh, did not tell us about Al-Qaeda being involved was a political benefit to him. Not only did Susan Rice tell us this was an attack spawned by a video in a mob that never existed. She said there was no evidence of a coordinated terrorist attack, and she went further to remind us that this president, President Obama, promised to get bin Laden. He did. He promised to dismantle al-Qaeda. They have been dismantled there on the run, knowing all the time there was classified information 
uh, quite to the contrary. Whether or not she knew that classified information, I don't know. But surely to God, the president did. Because mm -hmm. General Petraeus said, I informed the higher-ups that this was an Al-Qaeda-inspired attack. Who removed that from the talking points? We've got to find mm -hmm. out who that person is. And why did the president himself, for two weeks, continue to say he did not know about the attack in terms of terrorists being involved, that he thought it was a video, um, a result of a video? This doesn't make sense. And why do we need to know? It's appropriate to give the president high marks for bin Laden. It's appropriate to hold him responsible for Benghazi so future presidents will not do this. If, in fact, the President of the United States, on the Letterman Show, The View, and the UN, failed to mention that Al-Qaeda was involved three weeks before his election, that bothers me greatly because if the truth had been known, it would undercut one of his political talking points that we killed bin Laden, Al-Qaeda's been dismantled on my watch. I was fully ready to give him credit for killing bin Laden. Uh, it was a good call by the president. But like President Bush, who was overselling our success in Iraq, President Obama was overselling the dismantling of Al-Qaeda. And three weeks before the election, there was an Exhibit A called Benghazi, Libya, to prove to the world, if the truth had been known, that not only had Al-Qaeda not been dismantled, they had just attacked their consulate and killed four Americans. Do, do you agree with with, uh, with Senator Feinstein when she says that it was the White House did not remove I, I can't. That? I, I don't know what to believe. I do know this, <clears throat> that this White House is under criminal investigation for manipulating and releasing classified information around the bin Laden raid that resulted in a Pakistani doctor who helped us going to jail. When they talk about how we got bin Laden, they mention the name of a Pakistani doctor, and he's now in prison for life. When they talked about disrupting the underwear bomber plot in Yemen, the double agent and his family had to be withdrawn, and it hurt our relationship with the British. When they talked about the cyber attacks against Iran, which you could read about in the New York Times, it compromised our cyber attack program against the Iranians. So my point is, if they will leak classified information to put people in harm's way to make themselves look good, would they withhold information that would make them look bad? Somebody has to reconcile the fact that the people at the White House have a history of manipulating national security information in a political fashion. I don't know who took the talking points, the Al-Qaeda reference, out of the talking point, but I do know this. The biggest beneficiary of that change was the president biggest beneficiary of deleting al-Qaeda uh, from the talking points was the president's uh, political narrative that al-Qaeda had been dismantled. My Somebody needs to get to the bottom of this. My apologies for being that, that's late. Okay. Um, what, what have you guys done in the debt ceiling last, last week? Okay, uh, the <coughs> fiscal cliff looms large and here's the friction point. The Democrats are insisting that we raise top rates from 35 to 39 uh, on the top taxpayers. That generates about $440 billion. We've got to do two things at once. We've got to create jobs and we've got to get this country out of debt. I think Republicans should put revenue on the table. I think that's a fair demand to make of our party and quite frankly in the past we've been reluctant to meet that demand. I think it's fair for us to tell the uh, Democratic Party entitlements where the long-term money is that. Long-term debt is created if you will reform entitlements in a meaningful way, we'll put meaningful revenue on the table. The best way to do that is to follow the Bowles Simpson formula. If you cap deductions that an individual could, could take at twenty or twenty-five thousand, thirty thousand dollars, that would take care of every middle class person that I know. The people that would lose would be the upper income folks. They would have to actually pay more in taxes. By increasing the rates, I think you make it hard to increase jobs. So let's keep tax rates where they are or try to lower them and have the wealthy pay more into the system by capping their deductions. I think that's the best way to raise money. And if you do it that way, it raises twice what increasing the tax rate would do. So that's important. If you're looking for revenue, if you cap deductions, you can raise twice the amount of the money that you could if you just increase rates. I'm not interested in creating a political trophy for President Obama making him look good with a Democratic base, I'm willing to challenge my own base. I'm willing to say that the Grover Norquist pledge, 
has to be violated for the good of the country. And that pledge would prevent me from taking money from eliminating deduction to pay down debt. I think when you're $16 trillion in debt, I have to give. I think the president has to give. The one thing that neither one of us should do is hurt the ability to create jobs. And if you raise tax rates, that's a partisan solution. The bipartisan solution is to cap deductions, take that money to buy down debt, uh, and lower rates to help create jobs. But were you so, able to physically, did you physically do anything last week? No, we just talked, and our leadership and the Democratic leadership are about to put themselves in a bad spot. You can't get any deal done unless the rank and file will follow you. There are some Democrats saying you better not touch Social Security, you better not change Medicare. There are some Republicans saying you better not do anything uh, with the revenue, just grow the economy by cutting taxes. That's not going to work. We can't grow the economy large enough to get $16 trillion out of debt. We need more revenue. The way to get more revenue is to cap deductions. The way to grow the economy is to keep tax rates low. The way to get out of debt long term is to reform entitlements. I'm getting increasingly worried that we're about to put ourselves in a corner. The president's insistence that we raise rates to raise revenue, I think, hurts job creation. And I'll have a hard time voting for that. I can't vote for a plan that I know will kill jobs at a time we need jobs. I can vote for a plan that will increase revenue and, uh, and challenge my party to do that. I hope we don't get ourselves in a box on the Democratic side where they can't give on entitlements. Because if you don't change the entitlement programs, uh, we're going to become Greece. You, uh, this is for like two and a half weeks now. You've been on local television, you've been on national television, right. talking about fiscal cliff, Benghazi, and other things. Right. I haven't seen Senator Jim DeMint anywhere. Have you spoken to him? Have you? Well, well, Jim spoke up at the conference. Jim's been very constructive. He understands that there's got to be some give and take here. And uh, <clears throat> our party has got to show the country that we'll put the country ahead of ideology. So do the Democrats. If we're not willing to do that together, this country's going to fail. And I think a vast majority of the Senate and the House is in a good spot about defying ideology for the benefit of the country. But when you start asking me and Senator DeMint to raise tax rates to create revenue, knowing it will kill jobs, you're asking us to do something that just makes no sense to ask of us. And when I ask the Democratic Party to, to grow the economy and forget about Republicans putting revenue on the table, I'm asking too much of them. I'm going to ask them, let's, let's save entitlements for the people that need it the most. If we don't do something, Social Security and Medicare is going to go bankrupt. I'll have, as a retired member of Congress one day and as a veteran of the military, income apart from Social Security. There are a lot of people in my state that's the only thing they have in retirement. I'll have some health care benefits outside of Medicare. But for my aunt and uncle, they live off Social Security and Medicare is their only health care programs. Let's save these programs for people like my aunt and uncle, retired tax workers. And the way to save it is to ask Lindsey Graham to pay the full cost of Medicare premiums and to take less when it comes to Social Security benefits because I can afford to. Ask me to pay uh, the full cost of my Medicare premium, I should. Ask me to take less in Social Security benefits because my aunt and uncle need the money more than I do, I will. I'm willing to do the hard things, but I'm not going to do something that's politically motivated to destroy job creation at the time when we're about to go into a recession. Does, does Simpson Bowles violate the Grover Norquist? Pledge? Yes. Okay. But Simpson Bowles does not raise tax rates. Right. right. The pledge says two things it says we're not going to raise tax rates. Count me in. If you want to create more revenue to the federal government, create more jobs in the private sector. Every time we cut taxes from, Senator, uh, from President Kennedy to now, there's been a boom to the economy. But I do believe that capping a deduction and taking that money away from the few to pay down debt is smart. And what the pledge says, if you eliminated a deduction, you have to put all the money in lowering taxes. That means you would have no money for debt retirement. Democrats are not going to buy that, and I think, quite frankly, the country needs revenue to go on debt. So I'm willing <coughs> to cap a deduction, <coughs> excuse me, 
if it will do two things, lower taxes to create jobs and retire debt. I'm not willing to take one penny of revenue from the economy to grow the government. Republicans have been, been burned twice. We've agreed to raise taxes to cut federal spending. We always raise taxes, we never cut spending. So I will never do a deal on revenue unless the Democrats reform entitlements. Once you reform entitlements, you know you're going to reduce federal government obligations because that's where the real money's at. In 20 years, Medicare and Medicaid will consume the entire uh, revenue stream coming to Washington, D.C. because they're growing so fast. So when you reform entitlements, you really will have helped us get out of debt. Once Democrats say they're willing to do that, I'm willing to do the things on revenue that some Republicans say we shouldn't because we're $16 trillion in debt. And you're talking only about par portions of Simpson Bowles, not just the whole Simpson Bowles. Simpson Bowles did nothing on Medicare. It has to be addressed. Yeah. But get back to your question. Okay. What happens at the end of the year is that tax rates go up for everybody and there's a dramatic reduction in federal spending that will create a recession. It will reduce GDP by up to two points. That's